Wait, what does this mean? Hero crisis? I don't get it. Whoa, what? What is this? Well, let me explain it to you. In 2008, the European Union suffered its first serious setback since its creation, which became known as the Eurozone Crisis. During this time, various members of the Eurozone were found to have serious debt problems, which affected the rest of the EU, as they all share a single currency, the Euro. The Euro Crisis was a global financial crisis that pushed the Eurozone into its first official recession in the third quarter of 2008, experiencing negative growth in the second, third and fourth quarters of 2008 and then into the first quarter of 2009. Greece suffered a crisis in confidence as international creditors started to doubt its ability to repay the huge debts it had acquired. With the debt reaching 159% of the country's total GDP. Due to this, the Eurozone countries along with the IMF had to bail out the country for the first time in May 2010, followed by a second bailout in 2013 to help the country finance itself. Several other EU member states such as Portugal, Ireland, Spain and Cyprus were also unable to repay their government debt without the assistance of third parties, which resulted in significant adverse economic effects in the region. Okay, but what do they mean by flaws of monetary policy? One of the fundamental problems of the Euro lies in its single monetary policy for all countries in the Eurozone. The monetary policy, which controls the supply of money into a country by targeting interest rates, is controlled by the European Central Bank. This means that every country in the Eurozone has to operate under the same interest rates, despite the huge differences between the economies of the central countries, like Germany or France, and the periphery countries like Greece or Spain. This implies that interest rates can be too low for countries like Germany, which produce a lot, and too high for countries like Greece, who do not produce enough. Due to this, Periphery states like Greece, Spain or Portugal are able to exploit the low interest rates that would not have been possible without being part of the euro, as they can borrow money easily from international investors. This is not a big problem by itself, but when mixed with low productivity, it encourages nations to spend more money than they make, building up huge amounts of debt that they cannot realistically pay back. Moreover, during the 2008 financial crisis, these countries found it hard to obtain the loans they once found easy, as they were being given junk credit status by credit rating agencies. This mass borrowing by the periphery nations and Ireland was good news for the richer nations, especially Germany, as it meant new possible customers for their exports, which were being financed using money provided by them. This enhanced a vicious cycle. So Germany experienced rising trade surpluses against the euro, while other countries had large current accounts deficits, therefore accumulating international debt. A single monetary policy also means that individual countries cannot devaluate their currency by printing money. When the financial crisis hit, countries like the UK and the US were able to devaluate their currency by printing more money helping boost exports and becoming an important tool for restructuring their economy. However, on the other hand, countries like Greece and Portugal within the European Union did not have that option, and therefore, the only way to restructure their economy was through internal austerity, by cutting wages and decreasing government spending. Okay, so I got that, but um, what is the fiscal policy then? The second fundamental problem of the euro lies in the EU's fiscal policy. In contrast to the monetary policy, each nation has a separate fiscal policy which leaves a very mixed economic structure for the EU. 
The fiscal policy refers to the government expenditure and the collection of revenue through taxes, which affect the economy of the country. What has been suggested by many economists is that it is impossible to completely separate fiscal policy from monetary policy, as central banks can prop up government bond prices by monetizing debt, meaning that the central banks of countries can buy up the debt of the country. Although it is illegal to directly buy the debt, it can easily be bypassed to help increase the supply of money, which will in turn affect monetary policy. The need for monetary and fiscal integration can be explained through the Mundell Fleming model. Whoa, 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 wait, what? The Mundell. What model? What? I'm so confused. The Mundell Fleming model was set by Robert Mundell and Marcus Fleming around 1960 as an extension of the ISLM model but describing an open economy. The model shows the relationship between a country's interest rates, output, and nominal exchange rates, arguing that a country cannot simultaneously achieve a fixed exchange rate, free capital movement, and an independent monetary policy. This is known as the impossible trinity. The EU, for example, has a flexible exchange rate and instead decides to target interest rates and free capital movement. The model is composed of the IS curve, which is output is equal to the sum of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. The LM curve, which is money supply divided by price, is equal to the liquidity preference based on interest rates and output. The balance of payments curve, which is current accounts or net exports times capital accounts or cash flow. Okay, so we have the IS curve, the LM curve, and the balance of payments curve. But then how do you graph it? The EU uses flexible exchange rates, which means that the European Central Bank allows exchange rates to be determined by market forces alone. With flexible exchange rates, the Central Bank can increase the supply of money to try to boost the economy. This causes the LM curve to shift to the right, thereby increasing output and lowering the domestic interest rate in comparison to the global interest rate. This depreciates the local currency, making local goods more attractive and therefore increasing net exports. Increasing net exports shifts the IS curve to the right as well, up until the point where it meets the balance of payment curve and the domestic exchange rate equals the global interest rate. But while this returns to normal, the GDP increases once again, meaning that any increase in the money supply does not have an effect on interest rates in the long term, but does indeed increase the GDP of the country, and the opposite for a decrease in the supply of money. The European Central Bank increases money supply through quantitative easing, where it prints more euros for all the countries to help boost the economies that are underperforming. Too much quantitative easing, however, can be bad for the economy, leading to a poorer standard of living, bad reputation with foreign markets, and even the risk of hyperinflation. Therefore, the ECB has to try and balance out whether quantitative easing would benefit all the countries in the Eurozone. Another option with flexible exchange rates is to increase government spending. This fiscal change causes the IS curve to shift to the right, causing an increase in GDP and in the domestic interest rates compared to the global ones. This leads to the currency appreciating, making foreign goods more appealing and decreasing net exports. This shifts the IS curve back to its original position where domestic interest rates are equal to global interest rates and has no impact on the LM curve. This means that if there is perfect capital mobility, then an increase in government spending has no impact on GDP and vice versa with cuts in spending. This shows that both the fiscal and monetary policy are integrated and cannot just be separated like the EU have tried to do with the euro. Okay, but then what are the implications of the model? The EU also had to make the assumption that with fixed interest rates and a single currency, each country would be fiscally responsible. However, that assumption was proven badly wrong since, as previously mentioned, a lot of countries used low interest rates to borrow irresponsibly without having the output to support such loans. In consequence, they built huge amounts of debt. Greece is one famous example. Therefore, a new European fiscal compact had to be agreed between the European countries, aiming to stop states from running huge debts and forcing nations to adhere to fiscal stability. 
The compact requires national budgets to be either in balance or surplus, otherwise punishments or fines of 0.1 of the GDP and the loss of some of the country's fiscal sovereignty can be used. This fiscal compact shows an original problem with the structure of the EU, that regulation of fiscal activity in the Eurozone was too relaxed in the beginning. Another possible reform to increase fiscal union, recently advocated by politicians like Macron, could be set up to a common Eurozone treasury, headed by a single finance minister. Member states would contribute a part of their tax revenues to this treasury, and it would disperse funds across the union. A Eurozone parliament would act as a political watchdog and overseer. Okay, but then what is the future of the EU and the crisis? After years of crisis management, heightened self-doubt and existential threats, Europe is now in a much better place. Economic growth is picking up, political uncertainty has diminished, and despite, if not partially because of Brexit, the vision of an ever closer regional union is energizing some new constructive thinking in the core countries of the union. The previously discussed points suggest that the euro was doomed from the start due to some fundamental problems regarding monetary and fiscal policy, which need to be solved if it is to survive. These problems are interlinked as the EU cannot have one monetary policy and multiple fiscal policies. The EU will need to either centralize the fiscal policy of the Eurozone, giving more power to the EU Parliament over taxes and government spending, or give up some of its monetary policy and allow countries to print their own euros with some sort of maximum limit in place. The first choice seems the most likely as the EU continues along a current path of greater unification, bailing out countries to keep the EU in existence, and this could result in eurobonds as a way of reducing borrowing costs for each country and creating a safer asset for the EU. These systematic reforms, along with working towards greater political union, might be the only way to translate the recent improvement of re Europe's situation into sustainable prosperity. Oh my god, I finally got it! Thank you so much! That was amazing! <laughs>